episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. By checkers. Let's meet the panel. Hello, I'm Larry. Hi, David Bordelon. Charlie. And Josh. And uh, Charlie and Larry, it's uh, great to have you back. And, Thank you very uh, much. I'll bring Dr. Bordelon. Uh, great to have you back Thank as you. well. Oh, uh, great, thanks. Dr. Bordelon is uh, the uh, very well-renowned uh, English professor who we've had uh, uh, a few times on the show, and uh, we're going to have him on a little bit more for season five. Unfortunately, we don't have a moderator today, but the show does continue, and we are going over a work by Ernest Hemingway, a short work known as The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And because we don't have a moderator, I'm just going to ask the questions from here, and uh, we'll uh, take things from there. The first thing I wanted to bring up is uh, masculinity and femininity, uh, femininity because uh, we all know uh, where Hemingway stands on this. In this particular work, how do you feel that uh, he presents that particular issue? I'll, if I can, I'll get the ball going. Uh, at least I'll try to get the ball going. I, um, I think we all know this uh, gentleman, Harry, is depressed as anything because, uh, from my understanding, he was. Uh, I think he wanted to. And I read it. I read. I read this a few weeks ago. He was ago, injured. So. In, uh, he was injured. He got a, a flat cut. cut. Yeah. Yep. That and became infected. Yeah. He was. Uh, so he could have applied uh, iodine to it, yeah. but. And he chose to. Yeah. He just chose to let it go, and he he chose to apply something that wasn't as effective, right. and it, it turned into yeah. gangrene. Yeah, and you know, it, usually the first thing I do when I'm injured, I pull out a band aid and I'm putting it on, of course. But still, um, want to apply alcohol. To the oh well, yeah, alcohol, you know, sport. But back then there wasn't. You didn't really have all of, you know, the best of technology with medicine. Yeah, she had rubbing alcohol, but. I don't think it was as effective. Um, yeah, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> How does he portray masculinity and uh, femininity? I think, yeah. I think he does a very. I think that really had. I think there's a bit of a different, a, yeah. a major difference yeah. between that. Yeah. Well, I, no, I know. Think, think, think about yeah. the way the uh, the man treats it. Like the man, mm -hmm. when you think of a, a, a he just that masculine, yeah, uh, the masculine uh, urge is yeah. yeah. If there's a problem, who cares? You yeah. know. So I'm that strong enough. Sense. But, exactly. <laughs> Like, I don't need it. Yeah. Did yeah, I misinterpret the you question? You have that point to uh, abide yeah. by. But no, I, I, I probably misinterpret the question. Like I that. think with regard to masculinity and femininity, uh, he, I think uh, Helen is doing so. more, uh, Helen's doing more uh, uh, roles that right. are portrayed that the man has to do, but right. she has to do them. Because and he's and he's he's not. But she doesn't really question it as much. I yeah. yeah, it's more stereotypical. I mean, Hemingway yeah. often yeah. gets beat up on as uh, um, being misogynistic, but it's interesting in this story. Um, you have the woman um, uh, is the one with the money. You have the woman going out and shooting game to mm -hmm. feed the sick, uh, uh, um, febrile and, fra and fragile man who is now injured. So um, you see uh, Hemingway here, I think, really kind of playing with the stereotypes. I think on one hand, uh, she uh, assumes much more power than in his other works, mm -hmm. but mentally she's still very much uh, taking actions to serve him. Right. I, yeah, that's a good point. Like she's still, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, in a sense, taking care of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he does. Uh, <laughs> think a comment. He doesn't say it out loud, but he thinks to himself, Harry, as he's lying there, that uh, something along the lines like, women have silly thoughts, or she's thinking like a woman, or something mm -hmm. along those lines where, you know, you get the impression that Hemingway has very concrete ideas about what, 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 what the roles of men and women are. Right. Um, I think you have the times to contend with that, too. But at the same time, you know, I think, if, if I don't know if Hemingway has a contempt of, 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 of women as much as Silliness. I mean, he's he's a serious guy. You know, he's mm -hmm. he's like, he's he believes, you know, what a man should be. You know, a man should be uh, strong and, and take action against rough injustice. And rough and tumble. And, 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 you know, this thing. It is still very Hemingway-esque. Also that much. And uh, I think in in the case of uh, 
I think in the case of this story, he is pretty much saying, in the, in, the, in regards to that, that you know that the, that the woman, or or that that women have kind of silly thoughts, but I think really he's he's just more contemptuous of silliness in general than than of women, um, and of course the fact that he ascribes silliness to women, you know, is, is a problem in, in the context of you know the world as we see it now. Right. And what are your thoughts about their names being so similar to one another, uh, Harry and Helen? Yeah. The fact that he, it, it, to me, it plays on the idea that you have one that's a man and the other one that's a woman, Evil. and the man is injured and incapable, and the woman has to assume. I think he, I think he did that as, well, obviously, I think it's done on purpose. I'm 99.99, I'm like a Lysol can, 99.99% sure it was done on purpose. Mm -hmm. Just to, just, you know. But no, I think he did a really good job. It is a An pretty exceptional job. well Actually, renowned pretty good. Uh, I don't like that. work of his, yeah. I would say that much. Already, next question is, uh, do you find the use of italicized flashbacks to be helpful? Yes. And my reasoning for that is because with me, flashbacks are something I personally, it might make me look a little dumb here, but it's, when I, when I have flashbacks in a short story or a novel or what, whatnot, I, it helps me paint a picture in my mind a bit better. I can say, so that's what that alludes to, and that's what this, you know, you know, okay, now I know why, um, Harry is upset for no, you know, for this reason, and then I, it's, so for me, flashback, not in everything I read, you know, um, but for the most part, if it's, if it's an author who is somewhat not as accessible, you know, and, and Hemingway was pretty da darn uh, accessible, but, <laughs> but uh, usually some, sometimes I do need those flashbacks, and in this case, they, it helped out quite a bit. I, I think in this case, uh, in the case of this story, it kind of serves um, a, a pretty good purpose as to the how it relates to the end of the story, where oh, yeah. you have the italicized uh, flashback. So, pretty much keeps uh, you know the setting of the of the story in two separate realms, right? Where he is actually you know there at the time where when he's dying, and also at the time when he is. You know, looking back at his life, and at the end, he's pretty much, you know, like uh, I guess having a you know a hallucination or something, mm -hmm. something that that you know Hemingway might have used the italicies for, but by not doing so, I think that he's conveying you know that he no longer knows um, what's real and what's what's what, what's 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 going on or what what previously happened or what it, what what is not real. And, and in you, such, uh, you know, it, it kind of leads us to, to, to assume that mm -hmm. everything is working out the way that, that he's describing it, because it's not italicized, but then, you know, we come to find out that that's not the case at all. Yeah, just from a plot standpoint, it works out well, and you don't generally think of italics uh, working for the plot, but just as you said, like, it prepares us so we know anything in the italics is at a different time or something, and everything that is regular print or regular font is current time. So when we read that he's on the plane and getting away, you're right. We're we're led to think, oh yeah, that that's true. So good, he gets away. And then you get to the last uh, few paragraphs um, that opens uh, great. Just then the hyena stuff went for and the hyena is the symbol of death in the story. Yes. So it works really well. You get that shock, like, well, wait a second. I thought he was, you know, just free. So this is Hemingway kind of mm -hmm. going for that the kind of shock ending a little bit. Yeah, and just before that, too, you get, that, you get that moment of confusion that he mm -hmm. must also feel where, he, where he's like, you know, where you're like, why, why are they flying to the top? Of the right, right, exactly. So you get both things. Yeah, really good. And uh, more broadly, too, the idea of using italics, you had in uh, um, Sound and Fury, William Faulkner using that as well for when Benji talks. So this is kind of an established modernist uh, uh, convention to use... Uh, italics uh, uh, in in Benji that was used uh, in Sound and the Fury that was used for Benji's stream of consciousness uh, um, talk. So here it's used a little differently, but still it's like an accepted use of um, print or font. Italicize is usually used for thinking, right? And I think that it is a really good strategy. Yeah. And I find that in this case, uh, uh, Harry does a lot of thinking, and uh, that well, he's sick and he's got because he's sick. He's got he's got now he has an infected wound, so. Usually, you know, 
you do a lot of thinking when, like, especially even though. Yeah, he's incapacitated. He yeah. can't do anything. When you there's, think of people either, that are yeah. uh, in uh, that are uh, laid up. Uh, speaking of uh, drummers, I remember. Um, who was it? Was it uh, a Ringo Starr said one of the times he started drumming because he was sick for a while and he was laid up in bed and didn't have anything to do, so somebody gave him a drum and then you started drumming. So because of that, that led him, you know, to a career. So when you're laid up, you know, you do have this time of, yeah. of reflection. Yeah, and not only is he laid up, but he believes he is dying. Yeah, yeah. and I have met so Ringo. He's, he's reflecting on his life, and he's, and he's, uh, you know, yes. he's, he's full of regret right, right. For, like, for how he's. There were so many life. things I haven't done. There were so many drums I haven't played. There have so many cookies I haven't eaten. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that whole idea, because you can also, if you're using the thinking strategy, you can also uh, interject uh, talix into uh, the uh, the text itself. And, mix the two together. Uh, Hemingway primarily s separates the two, but then again, flashbacks are treated separately to uh, the current day. And he's done this in his fiction from the beginning. His first book, In Our Time, published in several times, published in 1924 and 1925, used the same thing for much the same effect for flashbacks. So mm -hmm. it's not like something this is, that he's doing new. This is published, I think, in the uh, 30s. Uh, 1936, I believe. Uh, um, so it, again, it's a, a technique or a, um, a trope that he uses. I guess technique's a better word that he uses to convey that kind of stream of consciousness. Yeah, it is 1936. Uh, it would be it's 80 years from now. But uh, yeah. wow. it's a better habit to have than a Cormac McCarthy eliminating quotations. I'll say yeah, that. yeah, it makes oh, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, but Cormac does that. Uh, uh, um, James Joyce does that as well. So I mean, a lot. It's so funny what we think of like these modern conventions. Previous writers have used them. You know, mm -hmm. so it's not like something new. You know. Mm -hmm. okay. Already, the uh, next question is uh, something that is a bit general regarding Hemingway, but I think it can definitely be connected to uh, this particular work if uh, you would want to as well. Uh, how do you feel is the best way to approach one of Hemingway's works? Well, first, if you if you don't know, much, if you don't know too much about the author back then, there was no such thing as the internet. What's that? Oh, okay. But anyway, uh, first of all, what I would do is maybe try and research a little bit. Maybe try and go about the history, and yeah. But also, reading it once is is good. But also, read it again, and maybe read it another two or three times. Because when I read this. I had to read it about four times before I was, and I, that's even before I had a working knowledge. So uh, always, you know, maybe always do a good, you know, in-depth analysis of the author or whoever, and uh, make sure you, you know, what you get yourself into. I definitely agree that uh, having a historical background yeah. in Hemingway is helpful. Yeah. And, and, I, and uh, usually, usually that's with uh, most uh, writers and uh, even music comp uh, com composers. Uh, Getting that history of their, you know, where they came from, and you know, mm -hmm. their, even the nationality. Too. I think that, but more specifically to Hemingway, oh, yeah. uh, I think it's definitely worth noting that he is uh, very pro masculine. Yes. Uh, the uh, role man. that women had in his life was very uh, shaky, I would say. But it's interesting because uh, actually he treated, and when you talk to many of the women uh, of, uh, that he was involved with, most of them had positive things to say about him. In mm -hmm. fact, he gave the royalties to his first book uh, um, to uh, his first wife. Mm -hmm. um, you could ar also argue it was guilt because he was mm -hmm. leaving her. Um, mm -hmm. But I think his relationship with women, um, it, it both both challenged, but I think even uh, um, challenging, but even that is coming under uh, uh, criticism by mm -hmm. critics as well, looking at it and saying, well, maybe he wasn't, you know, this uh, um, this boorish man all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, too, to, to think about when you read it uh, uh, is that Hemingway, were, Hemingway wrote on the um, iceberg principle, so which is very common now in that he's leaving a lot of details or information out of the story, like even with this. Um, is that a Jungian uh, frame plot with the 
you see the uh, the tip, but right, so right, much. right, right, right. Underneath, I guess tip. you could look at it that way because what he's writing at a time, you know, he's writing the early twentieth century when Freudian uh, Freudian theories are really coming to the fore, so he has mm -hmm. all that in his mind. But when you read a Hemingway story, uh, and perhaps that's why uh, you're talking about how you have to, you know, read it a few times because um, he he is leaving some things out, uh, um, <laughs> oftentimes very telegraphic, which some. Um, some critics ascribe to his early work as a reporter when he had to send news uh, mm -hmm. via telegram, mm -hmm. which was expensive, so every single uh, word or, or letter even, you know, you have to pay for. Uh, so you do have to be aware that he's not writing in an ornate style, and you do have to, I guess, uh, um, be more engaged when you're reading to make sure that you're understanding, oh, wait a second, what's mm -hmm. missing here? For instance, in a, a story, like uh, uh, hills like white elephants, exactly they don't mention say. abortion, but it's, but it's the subtext going on underneath it. Yeah. So you do have to be aware. And also, you were talking about time period. It would be difficult to use the word abortion in a story published mm -hmm. in yeah. that time period Basically, because it just, yeah, it, it, like, <gasps> yeah, you couldn't. Uh, they were I don't know about prohibitions, but I think it made it might have made it difficult for it to get published. It's interesting that you bring up hills like white elephants because mm -hmm. I've read it uh, a handful of times, and every time I read it, I see something different from mm -hmm. it, exactly. and I think it's much more than abortion. I think oh, a lot exactly. of it, yeah. I think we went over this last season mm -hmm. and. Uh, John point uh, really harped on the idea of uh, the lack of communication. Oh, exactly. Like how, uh, the, like every uh, healthy marriage. The yeah. man uh, was. Oh, sorry. Uh, the man was give, uh, feeding these thoughts to the woman, sure, thinking sure. that he was the one. I think it's much more a story that, uh, about a, a failed or dysfunctional relationship than it mm -hmm. is about abortion. The abortion is one of the things that illustrates the dysfunction of the relationship, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's the main thing uh, in the story. Mm -hmm. How it's just a simple procedure is probably the closest they get to it. Yeah, well, that's what they and that's what they said. That's what he's trying to make it a simple procedure. So just the fact that he's uh, uh, um, trying, you know, to make it so so seems so uh, um, but unimportant is a sign that well maybe he's not the best person for this for this woman, you know, because I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that really portrays him in the best light. And also, if we're talking about um, Hemingway's view of men and women. I think the American, and notice it, it's just the American in there, it doesn't even have a name, male, yet he comes across really poorly. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how in so many of um, Hemingway's stories, the male figures, yes, they're macho, etc., but it doesn't necessarily get them anything, and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. portrayed in a positive light. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to look at that. Is, uh, is he saying necessarily that this machismo is something good, is something positive, or is he actually questioning it? It's definitely something that you can argue, and I would not, I cannot say with an underline that Hemingway was a misogynist, because right. I don't think he was, or I don't think at something well, I you could probably point to different lines that say, yes, this is a misogynist thing to say, or yes, overall, the story seems to be misogynist, but then you could look at other works and say they're not. So it's mm -hmm. probably just best to say, you know, he was he had many different views, and he, uh, they came up, come up in different facets in his, uh, in his work, depending upon the needs of that particular work. I think, I think there's not as much dimension, though, to how he writes women. Mm -hmm. I'll say that much. Would you say he? That but he doesn't really write about him. Like I mean, his mm -hmm. big thing was I'm going to write about what I know, right? Mm -hmm. So he knows he knows the male perspective. That's the best. That's the most ideal strategy to follow. Right. Yeah. And he, that's what he he knows the male perspective. He might not understand mm -hmm. femininity in women the way that. So he he does not mm -hmm. he does not uh, delve into that as much because it's not. He doesn't feel that he can be true to it. It's right. going to eat away at a particular audience, but I think that with literature, Hemingway is writing for himself, clearly. I, I, I don't know about that. I think, yeah. he, I think you know, Hemingway had very strong beliefs on the, on the craft of writing. He, he, mm. he, it was the most sacred thing that mm. probably in his life was, was the ability to, to, as he put it, or closely to how he put it, you know, you lean over a typewriter and bleed, yeah. where he... he He's after the truth, and he's going to try his best to, to tell the truth through you know these fictionalized stories, and to get but to, but to get at something, to get at you know the heart of, of what it is to be you know alive, and what it is to be a man, and what it is to live and love and die, and those are, that's that's what he's trying to do, um, and so I, I think that you know you, you can't take that away from him. He's honest, you know. He's trying he's trying very hard to capture 
you know, the, the essence of life and, and put it to you on a, give it to you on a page. I think more so he's writing for himself as opposed to the fact that he's he's not writing for a market. Right. Uh, no, no, yeah, he's, right, he's writing, but I wouldn't put, I wouldn't phrase it that I'd say that he's writing to, to tell the truth. Like that's, right. Yeah, that's, I would say that much right. more so. And he's writing to please himself, not critics. Or he's mm -hmm. writing to please an imagined audience uh, mm -hmm. and not critics. So he's writing, you know, not thinking, oh, I have to put a sympathetic uh, male character. I have to put a sympathetic female character. Again, he's writing this as he sees it unfolding in his head, you know, as his imagination is uh, developing. Mm -hmm. They're very creative because it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I think. I, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> I it, agree. It it's, work. it's funny the influence that he's had. I mean, how many, uh, so many writers today look to Hemingway or uh, the people that have imitated him in later periods. I'm thinking like Raymond Carver, uh, um, Bobby Ann Mason. I mean, any of these writers who use the same kind of pared down style that Hemingway did. It. That's what one of the things uh, people, you were talking about uh, looking at it from the context of the period. Uh, the writing at this time, when you go to like a magazine, uh, like a, a magazine from 1930s, the usual magazine fiction, very florid writing, you know, very, what we would look at now and say, gosh, it's just too much, there's too much going on, very sentimentalized, and Hemingway was interested in kind of blasting that all out the water, mm -hmm. and um, it's funny that I said blasting all out the water, which is a very machismo way to look uh, at it, and mm -hmm. I think it's uh, apropos and, to Hemingway's style. And the fact that he wrote The Old Man in the City. Yes, yeah. I mean, he just, uh, the other thing just relating to the, the masculinity and the femininity is that he spent a lot of his time, um, you know, in the, in the, uh, in conflict, like in great conflict, in, in, in dangerous situations. Physical and mental. Yeah. Well, that's true, too. No. I, I think I've said this in previous episodes, he would just write and write and write and write and write, and then he would just start cutting and editing, cutting, cut, cut, cut. And then you would have maybe, what, three, you know, I think that's pretty common with uh, yeah. renowned uh, writers. Exactly. You know, like, and it was. I know for a fact. The moment hills like white elephants. I know he wrote the original manuscript was. No, it was not. You know, it was much different mm -hmm. than what it, uh, the original published. <clears throat> I can't talk today. What the what it, what the what he had first was completely polar opposite to what he had second. You know, the finished product. And if you, you, know, if you think about it, um, for something like me as a drummer, um, when you're you know, cleaning your cymbals, and this is, I know I'm digressing slightly, but there's a point for once. Uh, when you're cleaning away at those cymbals, you're getting, you know, you're taking off years of crud, and then you have that finished product. And, you know, the cymbals I have, some of them are, go back to the 1960s, and I like the sound, you know, but, you know, when I want to clean them up and shine them, I'm, you know, I'm basically what I'm doing is ed editing all that gunk off my symbols, and that's what Hem Hemingway did, yeah. and um, that's just my take on that. So. Alrighty then. Anybody have any final thoughts that we did not uh, bring up in uh, this discussion? I think for Snows of Kilimanjaro, I think um, in addition to the masculine and feminine, I think it's very much a story about an artist. I mean, here we have. Uh, um, Harry is a writer in the story, mm -hmm. and many critics have talked about like the autobiographical elements in the story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just as much Hemingway's comment on art. You were talking about mm -hmm. how you know he really was interested in getting at the truth, and you see that I think in the story. You see through Harry, you know, who's a writer who's really interested in getting at a version of the truth, the truth as. He sees it in the story as a character in the story. Sees yeah, it. and I, I think as he's looking back at the, at the things in his life where, where that he had that he never wrote about. Right, right. And he's trying to regret, decide yeah. what what he should have written about and right, what right. he shouldn't have. Right, right. And he, but um, I think, uh, you know, but he says something along the lines of, you know, I, I, I wasn't old enough to write about these things mm -hmm. yet, or because I, I think that he's coming to terms with kind of the senselessness right, of, right, right. of some of the things that he's seen in his life and, right, right. and how you know. Where these things happen, but there might not be some deeper meaning to them, mm -hmm. and then and maybe he, that's why he never. And he feels he left things undone. He doesn't yeah. really feel uh, like he was an accomplished writer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know uh, that's the feeling I got. And he feels like he sold out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. particularly that he sold out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you know, because he, he writes about his two lives, where where in one life he was the writer, you know, and he was 
suffering for the craft, mm -hmm. and then he, he traded that for the comfort of being a professional boyfriend. Yeah. And, but also Hemingway, I mean, uh, many people say Hemingway, uh, that this is a reflection of Hemingway's life, because when you look at his early fiction and his later fiction, it seems, I mean, people, we still read, you know, in our times, the story is there, some of the later works, uh, like Islands of Stream, which didn't even get published in his lifetime, you know, it was assembled later on, don't seem to have uh, the vigor or the uh, the strength of some of the early works. So I think he's kind of reflective in his own life. Like I think that would be done wrong, you know. Yeah, but it's crucial that he himself edits uh, edits it because right. uh, uh, you can't really uh, you can't really capture the essence of Hemingway. Right, right. Or is it Maxwell Perkins? And I'm so excited <laughs> that there's a new biopic on Maxwell Perkins coming up. Uh, that's going to show what was the editor's role in some of these uh, writers' careers. Hmm. That, I'll definitely have to check that one out. Just one, one more note. Um, I read the, the Garden of Eden, which was not really finished. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, had, he hadn't finished it. And then, they, you know, the, I guess the publisher or the editor or somebody found it and decided you know, that this should get out there. But it wasn't even finished. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just don't think that that story ended I don't, have you read it? Yeah, it's it's not really coherent because it's not really meant to be though because again it's he didn't finish it so yeah. it's kind of a symbol from note. But that brings up some really interesting masculinity and femininity roles. And then later uh, critics, uh, I know there's early biographers that mention that Hemingway uh, was had a dress put on him like when he was ten years old and stuff. But that sounds kind of shocking now. But if you look at clothing in like the nineteen in the teens, uh, young et cetera, kids, for young, young children, kids, yeah. The hoop uh, uh, Well, not so much that, but like uh, um, like many of the boys would dress in clothes that we would now call a dress, that they really looks mm -hmm. like a dress. So I'm That's even fair. wondering then if... Uh, I saw a picture of FDR when he was younger. Yeah, dressed in like, yeah, like almost looks like a smock or something, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, again... It like a skirt, yeah, a long skirt and uh, like a shirt, yeah, should shirt I just, with an overcoat. Should I just flat out say it? You're probably wondering, you know, I'm in a kilt because I have a band function later. But uh, I just, this is not a fashion statement because I, something tells me the camera is, you know, but still. Um, Reminds me of the first time I met you. We were waiting to get into history and grammar of English class. Yes, I remember. And uh, you were promoting your group and you told yes. your, that we're not going to name. Yeah, we know. I, but, yeah, I'm actually wearing a different shirt because the other one has all these things. But he on. said, uh, but yeah. I just you're gonna you can see me in a kilt. Yeah, yeah. Here I am in a kilt. You know, this is the. And now we the, see him in a kilt. Yep. Yeah, and because uh, I, I have a band function, at, you know, and I don't have time to change, so. <laughs> I'm trying to sit down now because I, I could just tell the camera is looking at you know camera is unblinking and these things are a pain in the neck. But since we were talking about the globe, yeah, kind of make perfect. I I, I figured yeah. what the heck, you know. Yeah. So if you are traumatized, you know, I apologize. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this story. I, I, th I thought it was uh, pretty brilliant. I liked uh, a lot of the symbolism in there. I like I like the way that the thoughts that are coming to his mind, especially toward the end, are, are kind of just symbolic of, of the very kind of crisis of identity that he's, that he's going through. Mm -hmm. This is not an identity of his, crisis. Uh, you know, he thinks of his grandfather, for instance, oh, and, yeah. uh, and when the house burned down and he lost his guns. Mm -hmm. You know, and to me, that's kind of symbolizes like you know a man who's kind of outlived his his use, mm -hmm. and uh, you know just other things like that. You know, and then it, you know he starts thinking about living among the poor in uh, in Paris and and people starving in the streets, and you know like you know again just looking for 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 some some meaning, you know, some uh, some kind of essence to, to to get at. If I might, if, uh, just Larry, when you the minute you said you know and. Especially today, it's not really, a, you know, the guns, you know, that m masculinity and the gun, that now, if this gets into that, I don't care, that's fine. But, you know, there was always something about a man with a gun, you know, he would, people would feel safe, you know, I, but, you know, and of course, guns are over, you know, 
go hunting with. You know, that's yeah, and Hemingway was a big hunter. I mean, he so was the big white uh, game hunter, you know, going to that Africa. That plays in masculine. And, yeah, sure, and yeah. coming back with uh, animals that he could stuff, et cetera. So, and this is and territory run, for Yeah, me. that runs throughout yeah. all of his stories. And oh, the Nick yeah. Adams stories. Um, hit me now. Yeah, the Nick Adams stories where, you know, uh, he'll portray himself going fishing or hunting. So, yeah, it's just yeah. part of the, uh, uh, growing up in a yeah. more rural area. It yeah. is yeah. interesting. Do it on in this story. It doesn't seem that that's the purpose for the, like, they're there to photograph. Right, right. Which is a uh, kind of a different, right. you know, separation point. point. Yeah, than what yeah, usually yeah. he would do in Africa. Right, right, right. Because then he has to get closer, and that was part of the reason why he scratched himself because he has to get closer to to because uh, when an with a rifle you can shoot the animal from far away, but if you're taking a picture, you have to get really close yeah. to yeah. get a good shot. Back and then, there's no such thing as zoom that. ones. Well, they had they well, had yeah. really you know clunky uh, yeah. uh, lenses. They were like but accordion, um, right? Well, uh, but he did have he did have to get close, and he, I think he talks about that. That was part of uh, the reason why he scratched himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny too. Like in the beginning of the story, she's she's kind of asking like this metaphysical, why 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 do we deserve this? Right, 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 right. And he and he takes a very. Uh, Pragmatic uh, mm. approach to his answer, he like because I scratched myself. Right, <laughs> we didn't have the carbolic, and they put carbolic acid on it, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have what we needed. Yeah, right. and yeah, we, yeah, his his truck's very down. sarcastic. Yeah. didn't go to a good mechanic. Yeah, exactly. Very yeah. self-deprecating, yeah. just deprecating in general. Honey, what happened? I got eat, I got ate by a lot. What do you think, honey? I got scratched by a, I, you know, something got at me. Right, you know? right. And yeah. that's basically what it would be in, if it was written in 2016. Mm. So, what do you got? Still, but. Okay, uh, the book that uh, most of us referred to was uh, Volume D of the Norton Anthology of uh, American Literature. Yes. That's, this is the one uh, Hemingway work that you can find in this particular uh, collection. Uh, uh, what, what volume again? D. Volume D is in Donut. He's got, yeah, I would think that you would make that uh, reference. Well, but yeah. uh, he, he has so much more that he's written. Uh, you can find his collections in just about any bookstores. Be sure to join us next time for another episode of Very Gladiators. For now, keep reading. <laughs>